Research Institute. So we've got a list of questions here. And so hopefully you can hear us with the wind. Um, Denver, you wanna give a little project overview of the Snowy Owl project before we get started? Okay, yeah, as you know, this is uh, the Snowy Owl Cam. And um, this is the 28th year in this research project. I came up, I think in 92, made some contacts prior to that. And the idea was to study snowy owls and look at the relationship between snowy owls and its primary prey in this area, which is the brown levy. So that started uh, in 92 and it's uh, still going today, entering its 20th season, I believe now. Okay, and let's just talk about the cam for a minute. So we've got obviously the live cam on a nest that a lot of you have been watching. Um, this is only the second time that's ever happened. You guys had a cam nest with Explore in 2014, is that right? Yeah, this okay. is, we, we put a cam up before, it was kind of a trial thing, and uh, yeah, it was, it was several years ago, mm -hmm. and, uh, and it was a little late, you know, we just didn't know exactly how to get it all done, and this one really will be the first one that you'll be able to watch them from incubation, hatching, and hopefully the chicks will get big on the nest, and right up to dispersal from the nest, or departure from the nest, at about three weeks of age for each chick. So probably the first first real one in the world. Yeah, okay. So that leads right into one of the questions that someone wrote in, and that is, is the nest located in a safe place? Is it a safe place, the nest? Uh, it depends how you, you know you think about that and find that. It's located in areas where there's a lot of research activity, but we've talked to the researchers in that area there, and they're giving the, the nest and the, the male and the female a wide berth, so trying not to disturb her. Uh, so in that case, it's pretty good because most of the photographers and bird watchers and sightseers will stay out of that area because it's a known research area. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. So we actually went to the nest. You may have seen us put a cloth over the cam when we arrived. We did a quick nest check. And why don't you tell us what we saw? Okay, so we went to the nest. Uh, the female was on when we viewed her from the distance. The male was at his roost site. When he saw us approaching, he went up to a high perch so we could get kind of a view of what's going on and then come in and monitor us. We checked the nest. I think some of the cam people had thought there might have been some hatching and so Liv and I went and checked to see if there was and we didn't see any signs of hatching in those five eggs yet. The male came in, uh, he struck me once, came in at Liberty and uh, she ducked under it and then the female came in, uh, screamed. We did what we needed to do, recorded that information, there were no prey at the nest, then we left, she came back, he went back to work, and that's how it works, is we disturb them for the research aspect of it, and then they get right back, they're very forgiving. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've talked, or I know I have in some communications, talked about the fact that you sort of know this male, you have a history with him, and so how do you, how do you recognize him, what, what is the history there? Okay, I think I know this male. It's the same area that's usually occupied by this male who's very, very distinctive in his voice and his aggression. Of all the males that I've worked with over the years, he has a very, very distinct hoot and a chuckle and a bark, and he's always hitting me. I think he recognizes me. He's quite aggressive. So we do have feathers from him, and we should be able to tell genetically if it is the same male over the years because we've collected the feathers from the male, the female, and the young over yeah. the years. So, and I, I think it's him, and he's acting like him, and he sounds like him, and, <laughs> and he hits me like him. Yeah, yeah. Um, so then that sort of leads into something that someone asked about, and that's flushing distances. And so, you know, I know today when we were walking up to the nest, um, there are geese around, there's other ground nesting birds around, who you almost, you know, you can practically step on their nest before they move. The snowy owl almost, when you can very first see her white head and you're coming towards her, she she flies away. So yeah. give us some more information about how how they respond to. They're very flux. unique, like that. They're unique among all the other owls in the world and most of the ground nesting birds here on the tundra. And the fact that their first line of nest defense is to see threats such as researchers coming in the distance and then slip off the nest. It's kind of a redirection is what I think is going on here. Uh, we've measured it and you know it depends from year to year it varies and individuals it varies but on average you know it can be 350, 400 yards in the distance when they see you approaching. They will sometimes let you come in sideways but as soon as you turn towards the nest and they know all right the line is towards me that's when they'll flush. You know yesterday we had a bird at another nest 
and she probably went off at over 400 meters. We've measured this all in the past. These days we don't measure it. We just, you know, estimate it as we go along. Yeah, okay. So that leads to another question, which is um, directly from the cam. And someone says, I've seen a goose walking around the nest. Does it have a nest close by? Yeah. Um, geese, ducks, uh, and maybe, you know, other, other bird species often nest close to the snowy owls. The theory behind that, and there is some data to back it up, but the theory behind that is because snowy owls are so aggressive at their nest, uh, and it will attack anything that kind of gets close, mm -hmm. including researchers, you know, uh, that if the geese, ducks, whatever, nest close to the snowy owl, then they'll gain protection if, like, for example, Arctic foxes come walking by, or some other, maybe mammalian predator comes in, the owls will immediately go into defense about that, and then particularly foxes, mm -hmm. and they'll chase the foxes off, which are known egg predators of geese, ducks, etc. And so by nesting close to the owl, you gain protection from the owl, even though the owl may eat some of your chicks later. But, again, the theory is better to, you know, have the owl take one or two of your chicks after the hatch instead of the fox taking all five eggs. Right. Or something like that. Yeah. So then another question that came in, what predators do the owls have to worry about? You know, there's not many predators uh, that they have to worry about. The foxes... You know, they may get a chick now and again, they may get an egg now and then, but the owls are particularly tough on foxes. I mean, they, they whack the heck out of the foxes. The gulls scare me, the glaucous gulls, um, because if the owls flush off the nest at great distances, and if you don't know what you're doing and you're not one of the researchers, so let's say you're a researcher or a photographer and you don't know owls do this, then you leave the eggs and chicks susceptible to owls, or to Jaegers and gulls. And so I think the gulls are the biggest threat from an avian standpoint, followed by perhaps by the Jaegers. Now you could have polar bears, occasionally you see polar bears come through the area and there's nothing an owl can do, but they can come in and whack it. They will whack a polar bear, they'll whack caribou. They'll just try to redirection that type of threat versus inflict any kind of wounds. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and even if you're walking in and the owls are focused on you, but then a gull comes, they're gonna shift their attention to the gull and maybe leave you alone. That's what I've noticed over the years, yeah. you know, and that's made, led me to believe that the gulls perhaps are more of a threat, mm -hmm. is that the owls would attack us, but if a gull came in, the males in particular would redirect the attacks towards the gulls. Right, right. So someone asked the question, um, do, well, you may or may not know this, but the snowy owls, particularly in a good lemming year, will cache lemmings around the perimeter of the nest. So today we did a nest visit with no lemming. We did another nest visit. There was one lemming. But you've seen as many as, what is it, 86, 86. around the perimeter of the nest? Yes, yes. So in a, go ahead. Well, well I was just going to say, so the question is, does that draw animals in, having that cache of dead lemmings around the nest? Is that a draw to predators? You know, I mean, it, it makes sense that it could be, you know, particularly like a fox that could smell well, or maybe, you know, elsewhere. It could be a red fox, it could be coyote, it could be wolf, it could be wolverine. You know, in Barrow we don't have all of those, but nonetheless, I suppose it could be a draw from something like the otter fox, but again, the snowy owls are very aggressive, right. particularly when it comes to canids, and so I think that they would draw them off. But 86 is our high, uh, piled around the nest, and it's generally so cold. Today is a beautiful day. It might yeah. be 40 out right now. Um, but generally, they don't rot very well because it's so cold or very uh, fast. Mm -hmm. And so they just pile around the nest yeah. and the females eat them as they need them yeah. and rip them apart. Okay. Uh, let's see. I was going to say, too, that just reminded me talking about the Arctic foxes and how they just are, they seem to go after them like nothing else. But you said that dogs occasionally that have wandered near nests that are fairly close to town, the yeah, owls attack them without fail. Yeah. Um, yeah. I've seen it several times with people walking their dogs along the road and the owls will fly. I mean, you know, what I think is a pretty far distance across the tundra to attack the dogs. Yeah. <laughs> and they will attack the dogs. Yeah. Okay. Another question. Um, what is the survival rate of chicks making it to fledge? Um, and then it says, I, I'm guessing that fledging is considered their first flight as opposed to, yeah. are you, do you want to explain that? Okay. The term fledge for snowy owls. Yeah, and, and what we do is our, our definition. First of all, we try to we measure hatching success, clutch size, hatching success, and so how many eggs hatch out of out of the group, and then we try to get it to where well, we can 
to nest departure. So at about three weeks of age, the young will leave the nest, usually in the order of which you know the eggs are laid and they grow. So one at five days old, you know, leaves sooner than one at one day old when it, they reach about three weeks. And so then we have success at that, so nest departure. Then we follow them, we try to monitor every three to four days, then we follow them until they make their first flights. And then we get them to the fledging stage, which we define as first sustained flights. And so we can get that percentage as well. And some years is very high and some years is very low. Um, each year is very different depending on the lemmings. The thing we can't do is really address reproductive success. So we can only say how many make it out of the nest and make it to the flying stage because in order to find out if they're successful, we have to know if those young come back and breed in the following years to be successful. So right now we can just get it to that stage and how many per nest. Uh, one year we had nine chicks uh, at one nest and all nine fledged. In, in other years we've had ten chicks at one nest and only four fledged. So it's kind of dependent on lemmings, lemming populations throughout the summer, and then weather. Mm -hmm. So that brings up something, not a question, but um, I know you've talked about in past years when lemmings start out really strong, you see a ton of nests as a result, but then the lemming population can crash. And that's when a lot of nests will, the, the chicks won't make it because there's not enough food to go around. But do we have an explanation for why the lemmings might start strong and then crash partway through the season? Yeah, I don't know if we have a conclusive explanation mm -hmm. of, of what goes on exactly with lemmings. And, you know, now that we've been selling the lemmings for, you know, I guess 28 years or close to 28 years, as well as the owls, I, I, I would say that I'm not a fan of cycles anymore, but mm -hmm. clearly population fluctuations. And what drives them, there's a million factors that may influence it. But it's like the good crop, you know, it only comes around once mm -hmm. in a while where you get a banner year of, you know, alfalfa or mm -hmm. corn or soybeans right. or something like that. And I think that's the way it is here. But we always think that it needs to sustain for the summer in order for it to be a mm -hmm. successful season. And that's what you see. You'll see a, a pulse, like, you know, as soon as the snow melts, there's lemmings everywhere, always, mm -hmm. whether it's high or low. But in order for me to define it from an owl's perspective as a high, it has to sustain through the summer. And when it crashes like that, that's when we see all the nest failures. And sometimes, you know, we can have half of 50 nests can fail because the lemmings, you know, crash fairly soon after yeah. the snow melts. Yeah. So that leads me to something. Um, so, so far this season, let's just do a quick overview. You've located, our study site here is about 100 square miles. Yeah. And so far, there's more ground still to cover, but so far you've located four nests. Correct, yeah. Okay, so monitoring three, and then why don't you just talk about the fourth nest that you recently discovered? Okay, so we had a nest, uh, the fourth nest, it was, was kind of neat. Actually, it was the third of the fourth. And um, I had seen her in a new area way, way out on the tundra and hiked into the site. Uh, and great, you know, I mean, she flushed. Um, there was a male way to the right and a male way to the left. And I, and I, on the way in, I thought, God, those males are kind of far away. But anyhow, she flushed and she had seven eggs. So that told me, oh God, good female, good male, good territory. You don't mm -hmm. have seven eggs. And especially in a year that was looking kind of low. Mm -hmm. So I, I was, you know, measuring the eggs, working the nest, looking around to see what was there. And there were no lemmings there and all that. And I looked up and about 40 meters from the nest, I saw a male laying there dead. And I thought, oh my gosh. And so I went over and I got, I picked him up and it was a male and he was dead. I thought he had been shot, but um, I couldn't find any kind of wound to indicate that. I couldn't find anything in the trauma. So I got him and I thought, this is bad. But anyhow, I took him, I left the nest, went back over. And I always go back a ways to watch to make sure she comes back for all the nests, make sure they get back on before I depart the area. And so she came back and I took the owl with me to the vet clinic, we x-rayed it, it had no signs of any trauma anywhere, no shooting, no no hemorrhaging, no, no any any signs of trauma, so we don't know why it died, and we're going to try to figure that out in the next step. So, presumably this is the male. So, and I'm, I'm hoping in the back of my mind that one of these males is the male, this is just something random. Well, anyway, so I went back two days later, she was on the nest, there was a male way over here and a male way over there. I went to the nest, all seven eggs, everything was fine, except, you know, no food, no male came in to defend. Usually a male comes in to either look at you or attack you or do something like that. So I, every two days, so I went after the sixth day, 
I, I went there and uh, she was on the nest, you know, so six days now I'm thinking without a male to provision food for her. So she's got to hunt by herself and she has to incubate. And uh, none of these other males, I'm thinking somebody step up and help out. We do it in human societies, you know, why not? So anyway, we went back yesterday and she was not on the nest. And uh, I went and all the eggs had been eaten by some avian predator, a gull or a Jaeger, a Gansu, and picked everything out. And those males were still way over there. And uh, we didn't see her anywhere. Uh, a little later on in the day, we did see a female oh, a half a mile away from the nest. I don't know if it was her or not. Mm -hmm. So yeah. so that nest failed and we're gonna try to, we collected feathers, we collected the eggs. So we have the male, the female feathers and the eggs. We're gonna to do the genetics to see if we can confirm. But what was neat and sad is that she sat there, tried to incubate those eggs for six days without anyone helping her. And, uh, and then I guess you just can't do it after a while. Yeah, yeah, okay. So then um, just talking about clutches for other nests you're monitoring. The cam nest, as you know, she's on five eggs. None have hatched and no pip. There's no sign. We still probably got a couple days before there will be a hatch. And then we checked another nest just now and she's on five eggs. No sign of hatching with that. And then the other nest that you're monitoring, how many eggs are there? Four eggs there and the first egg pip yesterday. On okay, that right. So we should be right. able to give you an update in a couple days. Yeah. Uh, hopefully we'll have hatching in a couple days. And I don't know if we mentioned it earlier, the nest that we just checked before doing this, who had the four eggs. Uh, we did not see the male, but the female, she was there, she came back in. However, there was a lemming in the nest, a 60 gram male, uh, which is very neat too, because the owls provide us with a record of what the males are bringing back to the nest. So if we look at our sampling, this is kind of cool. If we look at our sampling of the lemmings over the years, when we look at the average body mass in our lemming study and lemming sample, and we look at the average body mass of what's being brought to the nest, what we find, even though the sex ratios are about the same, we find that the males are bringing the heaviest lemmings to the nesting females, and they may be eating the small ones on their own, or maybe they're not even going after them. Nonetheless, there's a significant difference in those in our study sample and those that are being brought to the nest, almost a 50% difference in body mass. Wow. So it's cool. like, I got, yeah, I got to bring big ones to her and I can eat right. these little ones. Yeah. So even though we didn't see the male, the fact that she's got a cached lemming is a good sign. He's Very, been there yeah. recently. He's been there, you know, yeah. every day. Maybe he was just off hunting, didn't see us. Yeah, okay. All right, another question, and I believe this one may have come in from Charlie. Is there a best time of day to view the snowy owl? Yeah, you know, I, that's, that's a good question because a lot of people that I know work at night. They have that beautiful golden, you know, light from let's say midnight till four in the morning. And if you really want to see beautiful light on these owls, and there's something about night. A lot of times the fog goes away and it gets a little clearer, and maybe there's longer shadows, and the males seem to be a little bit more active in these late or late night or early morning. Uh, maybe it's quieter in the tundra, less people running around, stuff like that. Uh, maybe more activity with the lemmings, but. I think if you really wanted to sit up and you know drink coffee and like some of the cam operators must do <laughs> and uh and watch i would watch you know from midnight till four in the morning yeah yeah and just given that they are a nocturnal species even though they're up here with 24 hours of daylight the sun never sets still they are kind of tending towards those night hours it seems yeah yeah and, and that which is a great point because you know, those people who study them in the wintertime, you know, will tell you that, oh yeah, they can just be sitting there all day long and then come evening they start getting ready and they go out for the evening time. Here you have no choice, so it makes more sense. There were some activity uh, studies done on uh, captive birds and I do believe there was some indication that they got more active in what would be the night hours. Right, yeah. Okay, um, let's see, I know you've commented that well, like with your description of the nest that failed, there were some males around that were not part of a breeding pair, but were hanging out in the area. And you've seen several single males in the area. So why do you want to talk about males that are here not as part of a breeding pair and what that can signify? Yeah, which is interesting. You know, of all the places in the world, Barrow seems to be an exception in that there's snowy owls here all the time every year, whether they're breeding or not. And there's always territorial males and very few females. So 
If there's females around, they're generally on nests. But we, right now, we probably have a five to one ratio or more of males over females right. in this area. Um, maybe there's more males in the population. Right. Maybe some of these males are resident throughout the year. We don't know that yet. We're trying to figure that out. Uh, but if you're a female and it's a good lemon year, you're usually breeding. And then there's all these other males, adult males have territories. These young males that are spotted that look like females never have territories, mm -hmm. exclusive territories. It's just these adult, bright, white, older males that have territories and mates. Yeah, yeah, right, because they won't <coughs> breed until they're, the males won't be a part of a breeding pair until they're how old? Well, we think they don't start turning white to three to four or more years before they start turning white and then acquiring territories. So they may not get entirely white for many years, you know, before they acquire territories. And the thing that we can tell you about this, you know, these older white, all white breeding males is that they're the only ones that breed. The younger ones as determined by plumage uh, don't get to breed. They very often hang out on bachelor pads and don't have territories. Right, right, okay. And about how big is a territory first? Ooh, all? hard to say how big a territory is, but when we do some of the analysis of nest sites, uh, we find out that maybe they're three quarters of a mile to a mile apart uh, in, in, in some years. In really dense years, it can be a little bit tighter than that. But it's, it's interesting because most of the time, males are usually within a few hundred meters of the nest. And that's how you find nests. You look for a male perched on a ridge, vertical position, then you scan left and right of him and you look for a horizontal female with a big head sitting on a mound. Yeah, okay. Um, do lemmings, the, the number of lemmings in the area correlate with the clutch size? Yeah, um, no. Our data, I would say yes in theory, but our data doesn't show that association. Our data with the, with the trapping, the sampling with the lemmings correlates very well with the number of chicks in the nest that hatch, a number that leave, and the number that fledge. But it's, there's not a correlation at all between our trapping results of lemmings and the clutch size. And we think that's a product of the time of the year that we do our sampling, because when the owls are laying eggs, it's probably mid-May, mid to latter part of May, and you can't sample them because there's so much snow on the ground. So the owls probably haven't figured out, you know, there's this many, therefore I can lay eggs and all that. But we're just not sampling then, so it doesn't tie together, it doesn't correlate well um, with the clutch size, but it does with everything else. Yeah, okay. All right, so that is actually all the questions that we have, but. In closing, do you just want to um, say a little bit about 28 years of data and what you have learned, what sort of the state of the snowy owl in <coughs> this area is at least? Yeah, uh, 28 years of data. We're, we're learning, you know, we're getting there. Um, how much longer I can keep going, I don't know. Um, I think each year I learn more. Um, we're starting to try to look at the climate data. We got a grant here a while back to look at the climate data in relation to the snowy owls and the lemmings have been declining in Barrow. Is it related to climate change is one of the, one of the questions. We've just finished some analysis looking at temperature change and clearly there's been temperature change here, increases in temperature and the decline in the owls and the lemmings and it does, that doesn't seem to be correlated. So now we're trying to look at snow quantity and then quality which is going to be a little harder to describe. So we're, we're looking at all these variables. Um, but you got to remember the correlations, you know. So anyway, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to figure that out, and and maybe it's just um, maybe it's just a lemming thing. They're up and down, and there's no real prediction to it. There's no real cycle to it. Although the population fluctuations out there. Mm -hmm. So that, and we've learned so many other things. I just got to sit down and start writing a little bit more because everybody's getting on my butt. Yeah. So actually, let's uh, let's touch on one other thing because I think it's just a cool story. Um, you know, each year you talk about how difficult it is to accurately assess a snowy owl population because the tundra is so vast, their range is so vast, it's just really hard. And we're focused on a very specific area, but you always talk about, yeah, we, we don't really know what's going on out there. We don't really know what's going out there. Um, but, you know, I find myself still putting a lot of stock in the results that we get every year. So this year, you're humming along out here, monitoring the nests that we have, and you get a text from somebody, and why don't you just describe it? Yeah, I got a, uh, got a text here just, oh, I don't know, five or six days ago, saying that uh, people I know were doing aerial surveys in areas outside of our study area, 
and they were seeing snow owls nesting everywhere. And um, they contacted me, and we're trying to, you know, make plans to see if we can get out there. And that'll kind of go, that kind of, maybe it goes back to what we're saying. Maybe the temperature stuff isn't related to the lemmings and the owls. And over here, maybe the lemmings are having a better year for reasons that we don't know yet. But there seems to be a lot of owls uh, in areas outside of our study area. So um, that brings us to that whole question, how do they track the lemmings? And are we going to be able to figure this out? So we would need to go to this area this year, figure it out, look at the owl nests, look at the lemmings, go back to Barrow and make comparisons. Next year, go back over to this area, see if they're still there or if it's vacated, assess lemmings, assess owls, and then find the next spot. That's going to take a, an enormous project, a lot of satellite telemetry, a lot of aerial flights, and a lot of money in order to figure it out. You might have to go to Russia one year, Canada another year, Alaska another year, and figure right, that out. Right. So. Yeah. so anyway, uh, still a lot to learn. Yeah. Okay, I think that's, I think that's it. Thank you. Thanks.